In the world of crime and punishment, where tales of darkness and despair often dominate, one cannot help but wonder what happens when the pursuit of justice leads to unexpected revelations and a glimmer of hope. As we delve into the enigmatic realm of criminal justice, where the thin line between despair and redemption becomes ever more pronounced, don't miss the complex narratives of crime, consequence, and the human spirit. In Springville, the name Dylan Shoemaker became synonymous with an act so horrific that it shook an entire community. A teenager from Springville named Dylan Shoemaker has been given the toughest punishment possible for causing the death of a 23-month-old toddler, Austin Smith. Shoemaker, who is just 17 years old, has been sentenced to spend at least 25 years in prison for the terrible incident that happened last year. The terrible incident took place when Shoemaker was watching over Austin and his baby brother while their mum was at work. Last March 19, something awful happened, and Shoemaker was found guilty during a trial last month. I didn't mean to hurt him. The prosecutors said that Shoemaker hit Austin on the head multiple times and even used a pillow to try and make him stop crying. During the sentencing, a judge named M. William Bowler talked about how Shoemaker had fooled and tricked people. He mentioned that 13 people wrote letters about this case. The judge decided to give Shoemaker the hardest punishment, the maximum sentence. It's really heart-wrenching to think about what that little toddler went through. In the serene town of Somerville, South Carolina, another chapter of horror was etched into the community's memory. A 25-year-old babysitter, Erica May Butts, is facing charges of homicide by child abuse after a three-year-old girl, Serenity Richardson, lost her life. Butts allegedly beat the child with a belt in response to a bathroom incident, resulting in multiple injuries. The Somerville community is in shock over this tragic event. Butts has been denied bond and will remain in custody until her case goes to General Sessions Court. The child's mother, a close friend of Butts, expressed her grief during the court hearing. The case underscores the importance of safeguarding children's well-being and the severe consequences of neglect and abuse. Erica May Butts received a life sentence from a Charleston judge on Thursday, two years to the day after three-year-old Serenity Richardson died while in their care. They pleaded guilty to the crime in August. If you like this type of videos, then don't forget to subscribe our channel and also hit the like button. Let's continue further. Years ago, in 2010, the world watched in shock as a 19-year-old named Shondell Jackson faced the repercussions of his actions. In a 2010 courtroom case, 19-year-old Shondell Jackson faced his sentencing for the first-degree intentional homicide and robbery of 21-year-old University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee student Nathan Potter. The shocking events that unfolded that day continue to be etched in our collective memory. Jackson, alongside his 20-year-old accomplice Derek Thomas, attempted to rob Potter as he was walking home to his apartment. Tragically, their encounter ended in the senseless murder of a young man who had nothing of value on him. Jackson even reportedly smiled at the victim's grieving family as he was escorted out of the courtroom. Nathan Potter's father, John Potter, addressed Judge Rebecca Dallet during the trial with a heartbreaking plea for justice. He asked, is there such a thing as pure evil? We think so. The moment of sentencing, when Jackson was condemned to life in prison without the possibility of parole, turned the courtroom into a scene of unimaginable chaos. Jackson's violent outburst and profane tirade at the judge shocked all, as it seemed to confirm his cold-hearted nature. As the police swiftly intervened, it was evident that they had anticipated such a reaction, given Jackson's behaviour during the trial. Restraints and pepper spray were needed to regain control, in the somber courtroom, the life sentence of a once teenage perpetrator remains unyielding, provoking a timeless question about the potential for redemption and transformation within the human spirit. In a solemn hearing, a man who, as a teenager, fatally injured an 81-year-old woman during a burglary has had his life sentence without parole upheld. David Deshawn Moses was first sentenced in 2012 for the crime. The court decided not to change his punishment. 
Moses was resin tense because of new requirements for juvenile offenders tried as adults for murder with special circumstances. However, the judge found that Moses had done nothing to rehabilitate himself since his conviction and upheld the life sentence. Dorothy Sessions' daughter, Elaine Covert, spoke about her mother's significance in the family and the profound loss they experienced when Moses fatally beat her during a 2010 burglary. Covert emphasized that the only thing stolen that day was her mother's life. Moses' public defender, Terrell Wakeman, cited his difficult upbringing as a factor in the crime. Moses and two co-defendants, sisters Angelique Nash and Katila Nash, were all convicted of murder in Session's death. Angelique Nash was recently granted a motion for release due to a change in the felony murder rule. But Moses remains behind bars. The tragic case serves as a reminder of the enduring impact of Haynau's crimes and the consequences they entail. Then, there's the heart-wrenching story of Kay Sean Mann, who was just 13 when he committed a horrendous crime in 2010. Keyshawn Mann, fatally shot his mother's boyfriend in 2010, is now on the path to rehabilitation and a second chance at life. After being in custody at the Muskegon River Youth Home, Mann, now 23, is looking ahead to his upcoming release and the opportunity to rebuild his life. In a recent status hearing in Grand Rapids, both the judge and youth home administrators expressed positive assurance about Mann's progress and readiness to reintegrate into society. Mann shared his plans for the future, saying, I'm going to continue what I need to do, you know? I'll continue my life like I was before, before this tragic moment. Mann had previously agreed to a plea agreement in 2010, making him eligible for release on his 21st birthday which is in December. If he had been convicted of the original open murder charge, he could have faced a life sentence. Throughout this journey, Mann's family and friends have stood by his side, offering support and encouragement. During his time at the youth home, Mann has been actively working on his education, attending Mid-Michigan Community College and serving as a mentor to other juveniles in the program. Now, his guardians are assisting him in finding employment and enrolling in community college as part of his reintegration plan. In an effort to gradually re-expose man to society, the judge has granted him an extended four days each month at either his mum's or dad's home. Man's redemption journey is ongoing, with two more court hearings scheduled before his potential release in December. The tragic incident in 2010 involved the shooting of Jamel Stokes, who was 35 years old at the time. Mann claimed that Stokes had engaged in domestic violence and alleged abuse against his family, but these accusations were denied by Stokes's relatives. On February 27, 2012, a school day like any other turned tragic at Chardon High School in Ohio. Former student TJ Lane opened fire killing three students and injuring several others. He had a personal rivalry with one of his victims. With a 0.22 caliber handgun in hand, Lane unleashed a wave of violence on his fellow students, leaving a trail of devastation in his wake. Due to his age, there was uncertainty about whether Lane would be tried as an adult or a juvenile. I went to school, a gun, and a knife, and my book bag, and sat down in the cafeteria table and fired a first shot through the book bag. Following a competency hearing, it was determined that he was competent to stand trial and he was subsequently charged as an adult. In March 2013, Lane pleaded guilty and received three consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole. In Sheboygan Falls, Wisconsin, the name Antonio Barbeau remains linked to a chilling murder that shook the community. Antonio Barbeau, one of two teenagers accused of the brutal murder of an elderly woman in Sheboygan Falls, received a life sentence with the possibility of parole in 36 years. Barbeau's plea of no contest to first-degree intentional homicide in a Sheboygan County courtroom on June 24 was part of a plea agreement. Barbeau and his co-defendant, Nathan Pape faced first-degree intentional homicide charges for the horrific murder of 78-year-old Barbara Olson, who happened to be Barbo's great-grandmother. 
The tragic incident occurred in September 2012, when Olsen was brutally attacked with a hammer and hatchet in her Sheboygan Falls home. A psychiatrist provided valuable insight, shedding light on Barbo's cognitive issues, which are believed to have originated from a traumatic incident when he was just 10 years old, being struck by a car. These cognitive challenges were suggested as a potential factor influencing his behavior throughout this tragic ordeal. During the sentencing, Barbeau, in an emotionally charged moment, attempted to express remorse for his actions. However, he found it challenging to articulate his feelings in court, leading his lawyer to help convey his sincere regret. The life sentence handed down means that Antonio Barbeau will have the chance for parole in 2048 a significant year in which he'll be 50 years old. 17-year-old Jacob Matthew Morgan faced the legal consequences of his actions as he pleaded guilty to starting a fire that tragically claimed the life of 14-month-old Joshua Hill in March 2015. Morgan, who is autistic, was sentenced to 15 years in prison. The incident unfolded in Rock Hill, South Carolina, where Morgan's family, deeply affected by the ordeal, stood by their eldest son throughout the legal process. In court, Morgan's mother, Julie Hill Dover, passionately asserted her son's innocence, emphasizing that he was asleep at the time the fire started, as he had been left to care for Joshua by his stepfather, Mike Hill. Deputy Solicitor Willie Thompson, during a previous hearing, pointed out that Morgan had waited outside the burning home, failing to call for help or save his younger brother. These actions, or rather the lack of them, were seen as demonstrating malice. During a preliminary hearing, emotions ran high as Morgan broke down in tears and collapsed on the floor while prosecutors recounted the tragic events surrounding the trailer park fire that claimed Joshua's life. In a courtroom marked by sorrow, Morgan once again shed tears as he pleaded guilty to involuntary manslaughter, unlawful conduct towards a child, and third-degree arson. Another shocking chapter unfolded in Michigan as three teenagers faced life sentences for the brutal murder of Michigan State University student Dustin Frolka. Frolka's life was tragically cut short and his partially clothed body was discovered on the side of a freeway on February 15th. Prosecutor Chuck Sherman revealed that the three individuals involved, 18-year-old Samantha Grigg and Tyrell Bredenitz, alongside 16-year-old Brendan Heim, initially planned to rob Frolka for drug money. However, their sinister intentions escalated into a brutal attack where they used brass knuckles to beat him to death. The exact location of the attack remains unclear, but authorities believe it took place within a vehicle. Frolka's lifeless body was later dumped on the side of the road. Frolka, a marketing student at MSU, was not only pursuing his education, but was also a talented rapper and a father to a 10-month-old daughter. The three teenagers were arraigned in court, each charged with felony murder, armed robbery, and conspiracy to commit armed robbery. Each of these charges carries a maximum sentence of life in prison. Martise Fuller was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole for the murder of his ex-girlfriend, 15-year-old Kaylee Juga, and the attempted murder of her mother, Stephanie Juga. The sentencing was delivered by Kenosha County Judge Mary K. Wagner on May 19. At the age of 15, Fuller meticulously planned his actions, securing a firearm and ammunition from a friend while disposing of the weapon through a relative. His violent intrusion into the Yuga family's life occurred as they were preparing for a camping trip, with Fuller entering the home through the open garage. The prosecution highlighted Fuller's intimate knowledge of the home, his awareness of Kaylee's daily schedule, and evidence that he had previously surveilled the residence. Tragically, Kaylee was shot five times and succumbed to her injuries at the scene. Stephanie Juga after encountering Fuller on the second floor of their home, was also shot as she attempted to hide. The aftermath was a scene of unspeakable tragedy, with Stephanie Juga left without her beloved daughter. Prosecutors urged the court to impose the maximum penalty, emphasizing that Fuller had demonstrated no remorse for his calculated and deadly actions, driven by an obsession with Kaylee. Throughout the trial, witnesses recounted Fuller's relentless harassment of Kaylee, both at school and in her personal life, painting a grim picture of a young life lost to domestic violence. 
As these stories vividly demonstrate, the impact of heinous crimes reverberates far beyond the courtroom walls. Lives are forever altered, and communities are left grappling with the question of how to find healing and justice. While these cases are undoubtedly harrowing, they serve as a poignant reminder of the importance of a just and compassionate legal system that strives to protect its citizens. If you found these stories compelling and thought-provoking, please consider sharing them to raise awareness. Don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe our channel for more such videos. Share your opinion in the comment section. See you in the next video.